The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, iHeart Radio, Simul Radio, and Simul TV. To find out about the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit www.xzbn.net. And for the programming on the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV, visit www.simultv.com. Exxon Nation, my guest is Leela Hutchison. She is a graduate gemologist from GIA, that's Gemological Institute of America. She's an explorer, researcher, and published author on crystals, gems, and minerals. Her new book is Journey into the Giant Selenite Caves of Mexico, and you can find it on her website, www.thecrystalgiants.com and on amazon.com. In January 2001, Leela was on a team of first explorers to enter the astonishing giant crystal caves. These colossal pylons of crystals are located nearly 1,000 feet down inside a 200-year-old working silver mine and is in the village of Nika, Chihuahua, in the Tarahumara Siadri Mountains. Now, these caves contain what are known as the largest crystals on Earth, ranging in size uh, to approximately 40 feet tall and weighing as much as 60 tons and estimated to be 550,000 years old. Joining me now is Leela Hutchison. And Leela, welcome to the Exxon. Hi, Rob. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's great having you with us. Uh, what was it that, you know, helped you decide that you wanted to be a gemologist? Um, in 1996, I decided that I wanted to get mm -hmm. into hands-on healing. And, and when I started to do that, I started to understand that there were many layers of energy around the body and in the body, the physical body. And the more I started connecting energy to energy, um, I started having a number of things happen to me that led me to be more curious about crystals. Mm, such as? And, well, uh, I was invited in 1997 to head up to Plumas County. In fact, I wrote about this uh, in Northern California where I live mm -hmm. and actually go up on top of a mountain and under an oak tree to dig for quartz crystals that were growing off the, the uh, dendrites of the root system of this oak tree. And so we, there were three of us and not only did we dig underneath the tree, but there was actually a room that was underneath this tree where people had gone in to bring out backpacks full of crystals so that was the beginning for me to understand um, uh, my love of that and curiosity I took all those crystals back home with me and mm -hmm. gave them all away except for three yes uh, they actually that was what I was guided to do and little did I know three years later that that 
being underground and feeling all that suffocation that I would be in the crystal caves in Mexico invited down to be on a uh, government expedition sanctioned a government sanctioned expedition to help the miners and the mining company explore what was inside these deep pockets well, of material. You said that you were guided to do this. Who guided you? Yeah, guided to, uh, when I said that, you mean guided to go into that? Uh, you, know, to fo you know, to follow your love of crystals. Oh. Well, I think this is a really important thing, and I think you understand it because you're a musician mm -hmm. and probably love music. I do. Is it's It's passion. It's like, oh, my God, I, this is beautiful. This makes me feel good. It excites me. I don't understand it. It's a mystery. <laughs> what is this all about? Why do I love it? What, is, what do I want to find out? What do I want to follow? What can it show me? Where can it lead me? So those were the questions that I was um, asking myself just based on that navigation uh, of passion. So would you say, how big were these crystals that you brought home with you, and why did you keep three of them? <laughs> okay, so this is quartz. So silica dioxide is very, very different from selenite crystals. Okay. Selenite crystals are extremely soft, and mm -hmm. they grow. They have to have a very moist environment in which to grow because they're, they're, they're formed through water and minerals. But quartz crystals are like formed inside pegmatites, which are really like deep pockets of heat and pressure. So this is where we get quartz crystals to grow. And so in this curiosity, my friend uh, who was a, uh, he worked on the, uh, on the marina over in Oakland, his buddy, and he had gone up to the mountains and had brought back this backpack full of these quartz crystals that were in clusters. Some of them were very tiny. Some of them were oh, as big as a salad plate. Wow. And the fact that they had mined those crystals, most people that are that love crystals that go to these crystal gem fairs mm -hmm. and go to the Tucson gem show or the Denver and all over the country, these crystals have been handled by many, many, many people. When you unearth a crystal yourself, that's a whole different ball game of the excitement and the heartache and the uh, for me it was just the feeling of near suffocation of being underneath and digging my way with the dirt right in my face and just having my arm with a screwdriver trying to um, leash some of these coarse crystals that were stuck in mud and roots and tap roots of a, of a tree. What is the significance of a quartz crystal when it comes to the healing modalities that so many people use as crystals to these days? All right. So quartz crystals have the ability to hold a program. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, most of us, we have lost, like many things, we're just, we're ancient, ancient civilizations and people understood a little more of the power of using crystals. Remember, crystals are just the gem portion of a mineral it's the part that crystallizes and sometimes it's not a very good crystal it's almost completely uh, uh, obscure so right. you can't see through it and sometimes it's a very high gem quality where it's completely transparent with a very vivid color yeah right yes so quartz crystals were used in old times in olden times um, because people understood how to use them. It's actually, it's your thoughts. You work with your thoughts and the, and then you can tra channel or transfer those images into the crystal. So, but for me, I'm a healer. I do healing work. So when I use different types of quartz crystal, whether it's carnelian um, or citrine or amethyst, these are just the different colors of quartz crystals. Um, these have an ability to hold a program. So if you if you program it with an intention or a thought, it will hold that. That's why many times you hear in, uh, in these days is that if you do have a crystal and you buy them at some of these gym fairs, you need to take them home and make sure that you put them in water or some salt or outside, and you want to clean. 
you want to energetically clean those crystals so that they can start with a zero program of somebody else handling them. Does that make sense? It, it does. It does. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're just erasing all the data that's been put there by all the different people who have touched it and transferred their, their thoughts and, and their programming into the crystal. So that's that right. when you get that's it at my home, theory yeah. of it. That's exactly you want to you want to recharge it and, mm -hmm. and program it with your intention and your love. And God forbid you put a negative thought in those crystals because everything gets amplified. And if should you put that out in the world, it only comes back to you. So think of quartz crystals as amplification. Mm -hmm. Where selenite crystals are more like data. They receive and transfer data. They don't really hold data. They do to some in, in, to s some degree, some information, because they're made out of water. And water, created water, water holds memory. We know that through the, the Japanese scientist, Dr. Emoto. So you can program water crystals, and they'll hold a certain vibration. So that, that, that definitely is, with selenite, they're more of transmitters and receivers. Just if you, as you look at them, as yeah. I sent you some pictures... I thank you. Or you can go to my website at thecrystalgiants.com and should be able to see some images of the very first crystals that came out of the uh, Nika All caves. right, we're going to hold it right there because I have to take a commercial break here. Exonation, Leila Hutchison is our special guest, www.thecrystalgiants.com, and she's the author of a new book that's out there, Journey into the Giant Selenite Caves of Mexico. It's available on her website and amazon.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Exo Nation, Leela Hutchison is my special guest. Her website is thecrystalgiants.com. She's the author of a new book entitled Journey into the Giant Selenite Crystal Caves of Mexico. It's available on her website and as well as amazon.com. Um, tell me about your exploration into the Nika Caves because that's why I stopped you there because I wanted to give you enough time to explain it because after reading the information that you were kind enough to send us, I find this very exciting. I'm glad you do, Rob. It's a very curious subject. Believe me, it's had me um, deep on the trail mm. of research for the last uh, at least 15, 16 years of my, my life. Um, it was in, um, after I'd gone into those quartz crystal um, pocket underneath the oak tree, I, little did I know that I would totally forget that experience that I had been underground. I thought that was fascinating and that three years later as I was actually moving to Sedona um, at that time, that mm -hmm. was October of 2000, I ran into a person that I had been doing charitable work with, with a fascinating group of runners from an, uh, 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 an Indian uh, nation of uh, northern Chihuahua, Mexico. They are called the Tarahumara Indians. They are known, see this is all tied together. Okay. They're known as the fastest runners on earth. These guys were brought to the United States by uh, a, a person who coached them into the Leadville 100, the Los Angeles Crest. This was in the 90s. And they would far surpass, beat some of the top elite runners in the world they would stop at the uh, water stations and smoke a cigarette and had their <laughs> had their warachis, if you want to call them that. They made their own sandals. Right. Their legs were as, they're as strong as tree trunks. 
and they learned as a very young to um, carve a ball out of ironwood, a very, very dense, heavy uh, wood, and kick that with their bare feet or their bare toes. They would have something underneath. But these are these runners were in Copper Canyon, and they lived remotely in these very stark areas of the Copper Canyon and sometimes in caves and small villages that crisscrossed all over uh, this very deep canyon that is, um, I believe, almost two and a half times deeper than um, the Grand Canyon, if you can believe that. Now, that's a that's a very deep, that's yeah. a very deep amount. Holy cow, twice yeah, that. Yeah, it's a very, Ooh. I believe so. I believe it's... But but I but I, I just like to interject to you something if I if I could, when you were sure. describing the runners that would go to the uh, the the uh, the drink stations and they'd have a cigarette, so so does that mean that cigarettes are really not bad for your health? <laughs> because these guys are fast. Yeah, they're really fast. I don't know the ultimate outcome of longevity <laughs> of their lives, <laughs> Rob. I wish I could. I just admire him. But there was a guy named Rob McDougal, very cool guy. He wrote um, a book called Born to Run. Mm -hmm. And it was his journey and of spending time with the Tatahamaras and with some of these other elite runners out of the 60s or 70s or right. 80s that trained with these crazy, if you want to call them crazy, but very incredibly uh, connected to Gaia, to Earth, mm -hmm. uh, nature, who lived uh, in Copper Canyon and helped these guys learn how to run endurance. The Tarahumara Indians will run up to 100 miles at one time to the point they'll run deer down. Holy so cow. their endurance is incredible. Uh, they're the ones, and because of Rob McDougall, chia seed, you know how, how popular that is now sure. as a superfood? Yep. Well, that's what these Tarahumaras would, uh, they would eat that. And the chilicote tree as well. There was a, well, those are a, a poisonous red berry. That goes into a whole other story about the giants and the giant bones found. Hmm. So you can see what's happening. I'm digressing a whole lot because it's, there's so it, many pieces it, to this. It's, it's, it's just, all right. If we don't get them through this hour, <laughs> we'll bring you back on and we'll have one heck of a cliffhanger. Well, we'll do it because I'm, I'm getting ready to write my second book called Mysteries into the Chihuahuan Desert because the more I said, what the mm -hmm. heck is this? Why was I chosen? And I call it chosen yes. because I had an opportunity to be in these crystal caves mm -hmm. to, of this gigantic enormity, enormity of a, a crystal specimen eight years before National Geographic ever got down there and uh, or anybody else. Actually, we were like the very first explorers to bring out these rare images. And this is what I've been teaching about all over the world uh, and presenting even to the Smithsonian Institute this year. Yeah, you might have read that in my bio as I sent you, is that uh, mm -hmm. I had the good pleasure of sharing those original photos with uh, the Smithsonian because they didn't have them. Yeah. Let, let, me ask you, <laughs> let me ask you something. Here you are in this cave with 40-foot yeah. tall beautiful crystals going some of them weighing up to 60 tons going back as old as 550,000 years that's half a million years what how did you feel well i felt like somebody had uh, turned on a great surge of electricity if you mm. if you call it that but more because it's water so it's more magnetic right. i just felt a great surge of energy and yet completely depleted and exhausted. I got to tell you the conditions of the cave. Okay. Because, again, this is all I'm going to connect this back to the Tatar Humara because I don't want to leave this to your listeners wondering like, well, what does this have to do with crystals? Something's going on in that Copper Canyon area that's creating paranormal uh, experiences and circumstances there. Such as? Well, First of all, again, the Tarahumara are a very uh, extreme endurance running uh, mm -hmm. race of people. They're also considered to be the precursors and pre-runners of the first uh, indigenous nation of northern Mexico. Okay, but I, 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 I meant how... How do you tie the paranormal into Copper Canyon? Well, a couple of things. Again, because yeah. they have these, uh, what you would call them as superpowers of endurance runners, number oh, one. Okay. Uh, then you have... Uh, we have at least cited three different uh, historical reports from the late 1800s through uh, uh, early 1900s and up to 1950 of giant bones that have been discovered in pockets of caves inside Copper Canyon where these uh, amazing endurance runners uh, live. 
All right. And then we have a number of UFO crashes that have happened in the southwest and certainly uh, on the border between the Chihuahuan Desert and Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Oh, so, okay, let, let me stop you here because I can understand the giant bones. I can understand some of the paranormal activity. But how do you know that there have been UFO crashes there? Uh, what's been documented is the uh, Mexico's Roswell that was written by my good friends, and you may know them, Rob. Uh, uh, Ruben Uriarte, who is the director of Northern California MUFON, and Renoe Torres. They both collaborated mm-hmm. on the report of the 1976 um, uh Mexico's Roswell but, uh, all right, crash. But, but once again, there was no evidence of the crash that was ever retrieved. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, they, what they know is that, uh, well, <laughs> okay, uh, tell me more. How do you know that there was no evidence? Do you know about this one particularly? Yeah, yeah I, I, I do. And just like yeah. with all the other UFO cases that are investigated by MUFON, all smoke, no mirrors. Yeah, but that's, I'm not talking about MUFON. It was investigated but, but, before but, MUFON. But still, but still, there, there was never any evidence collected and shown to the public. Yeah, never. Why? Never. Well, my, my understanding is, you know about that. That's a very fascinating case where like 20, 26, 27 Mexican soldiers were found dead at that site. Okay. That doesn't okay. mean it was an alien spacecraft. Yeah, they had loaded it up on a semi-trailer and were taking it out. And there were reconnaissance but, planes but, from the United one, States. But once again, once again, this is all hearsay, speculation. I know. I'm no frustrated, evidence. too. I understand. You know, and, and I think that this is one of the biggest problems that the UFO community is facing today, that there's a lot of, a lot of hearsay and no evidence. And this is why mainstream media and, and others who would pay attention to ufology before are losing interest. Well, this is a big subject, and it's not my it's not my specialty. Yeah. All right, my specialty has to do with many things of paranormal activity and experiences, and there have been witnesses, you know. Again, but can the witnesses prove it? That's that's the question. Yeah. Um. The cave itself. You know, everybody listening tonight. Is well aware what happened with the young P, the young soccer team, and how they were trapped in a cave for for a great number of days. Were you ever in fear when you were doing your exploration in the cave that something might happen to you and your fellow explorers? Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. These conditions were very different, mm-hmm. very much different than most. As as those those twelve soccer team players and their coach were exposed to very cold water yeah. conditions this was different something very very unique had happened there all and right we're going to take it, another break here because i have to take my news all these are hard set breaks we have to take them when the network tells us to so please stand by exo nation leela hutchison is our special guest wow what a, what an exciting life imagine that <laughs> being in a cave with 40 foot crystals weighing up to 40 tons uh, 60 tons as much as 60 tons and these crystals, Exxon Nation, estimated to over half a million years old. Wow. Talk about something that's going on my bucket list. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue talking to our very special guest this hour, Leela Hutchison. Her website is thecrystalgiants.com. And the name of her book is Journey into the Giant Selenite Caves, Crystal Caves of Mexico. And it's available on her website at amazon.com. I'm Rob McConnell. Leela and I return on the other side of this news break. Don't go away.
All right, just imagine this. Crystals that are over 40 feet tall, weighing 60,000, I'm sorry, 60 tons. That's 120,000 pounds, estimated to be 550,000 years old. That's more than half a million years. My guest right now is the lady who was there, who saw them, who broke the news and, and you know, went to the National History of Los Angeles uh, Gem and Mineral Council. She's gone to the Smithsonian. She's done radio and TV internationally. Her name is Leela Hutchison, and her website is thecrystalgiants.com. Her book, Journey into the Giant Selenite Caves, uh, Crystal Caves of Mexico, and it's available on her website and on Amazon.com. And Leela, thank you so much for joining us. I've got, I've got to have this in my bucket list. <laughs> All right. Well, you're going to think twice about this before you put it on your bucket list, and I'll tell you why. Okay. These crystals, how they were formed, Rob, mm -hmm. and I want your listeners to imagine that there was a massive inlet sea. It was called the Sea of Thetis. It was a ancient, ancient ocean that over time became an aquifer. Okay. And so when you think about the Chihuahuan Desert where these crystals were formed, mm -hmm. we're looking at over 200,000 square miles of some of the most stark desert you can imagine. It's, it's really hostile. It's rough out there. And it touches portions of Texas, New Mexico, mm -hmm. and Arizona. But this is mostly northern Mexico. And in this area... This aquifer so now sinks below the earth through layers and layers of different strata. Right. As it does this, and there's limestone, mm -hmm. okay? As this does this, somewhere occurring in time, there is either an earthquake or there is some kind of an, a pole shift. Something has happened where as this aquifer sits deep down on magma. Now, magma is much further down, right? There are like kimberlite pipes, right? This is where magma chambers come up and they heat part of the crust from the mantle. Somehow, whatever shakes and jolts and disrupts the earth, it pinches some of this magma. So it doesn't recede back down into a core. Mm -hmm. And now it becomes like a perpetual Bunsen burner. I, I was so, going to say a giant size uh, pressure cooker. You, in a way, it is. So yeah. you've got to think about this aquifer that's underneath there, exactly. And now you've got this heating, mm -hmm. this water. So what happens is that there's cracks in the bedrock, and there's fissures in the bedrock, and there's a hydrothermal chemical exchange of minerals. And so the water has now come into some of these half-eaten pockets, right? Because limestone uh, interacts like with the carbonation of the water and creates holes. That's where we have Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico and many other caves are created like this. And this begins to fill up with water. So think of this. It wasn't until 1970s that the Panolas Mining Group or whoever had the mine at that time, Panola mm -hmm. Mining Group owns it now out of Mexico City, had no idea when they drained water through pumps that these pockets would be in cavities. You can, they're not, yeah, they're like little pockets, you can call them caves, but their cavities would be growing these incredible crystals that had been for a, a half a million years. So now you, what you have is you've got an environment in the world and especially in the mining industry, this is considered the most hostile environment ever to work in because what you're seeing now and what we experienced, it was 130 degrees, 136 degrees when the crystals were formed. Eight months later, as the steam is leaving and going into the tunnels of the mine, it's now 128 degrees. It's completely dark. There's no lighting in there. And it's 100% humidity. My gosh. How did you find your way around? We had the, <laughs> the, the illustrious light of a miner's helmet, which is nothing. I don't know how many candles a miner's helmet is. It's not many. Yeah. And a battery pack, 
that Mm -hmm. most of us that were on this little team, there was only like five of us that went in there at that time, you know, would cinch up our our belts. We lost so much water weight and were completely exhausted to the point where we had to lay down after we were in these caves. And the first one we were in for about 42 minutes, and that almost defies a physical uh, human being of being in there because what happens is that a person can go unconscious with that type of heat very, very quickly. There's no way to wick or to cool the organs down in the body, including the brain. Were you walking? Were you crawling? Were, were crawling. You, oh if you, again, and I might, if my book will show the rare images, and I may, I, I can't say in this lifetime it might be a collector's edition, but maybe for somebody's grandkids. Oh, I, I think don't it's know. going to be a collector's image way before then, young lady. Well, I, I really hope so because they're such rare, rare images, yeah. and they're, and they're, you'll see many pictures of. Uh, of the photographer that uh, and the the guy that actually got us all in there to uh, you'll see me crawling all over those crystals, uh, and there were many many more and they were submitted to uh, the Smithsonian in April of 2002, Rob, and it was called Crystals and Moonbeams and the uh, uh, Western editor of the United States was John F. Ross at the time and so Smithsonian the Smithsonian already knew that things were pointing very early on that. Mm-hmm some magnificent discovery had been made on planet earth of the largest crystals ever found. Let me ask you this question. There used to be a large sea where the Sahara desert is today, approximately the same time in, in history where the, where the sea was in, in the area that you were doing your, your, ex, you know, your exploring. Is it possible that there are many crystals in caves like the cave that you explored beneath the Sahara Desert. Well, possibly. Again, this is going to have to deal wow. with... It, 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 it would have to repeat mm-hmm. an incredible condition of where a pinch of magma right. was sealed off and actually, you know, is, is a perpetual Bunsen burner right. that is heating the water. So we it's do know through NASA space scientist, mm-hmm. astrobiologist uh, Penny Boston, Dr. Boston, who was on the team in 2008 and 10, they, once they came back from that exploration into the Nika Crystal Caves, they said, oh, man, we know that there's more pockets of these, at and plenty any, more. At any time, besides the physical dangers that you and your fellow explorers faced i mean cave-ins getting lost the water loss in in yourselves the exhaustion that you that you had were there any was there the possibility of any organic bacteria or organic matter that could have could have uh, been detrimental to your health well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. So let's talk about that. So okay. the organic matter is is bacteria, mm-hmm. microbes. Yes. And I am sure that we took some of that out of there. And the crystals, they actually, do you, have you ever heard of something called an anhydro? It means it's a bubble of water inside a crystal? No, they call I haven't. Them, no. Yeah, okay. So what happened in 2008 is when... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, NASA came down there, uh, and the team of explorers, they took a drill bit, which broke, of all things, of all things. That's how hardened, the, at, a, at a two on the most scale of hardness. But once they were able to drill in and collect samples of the water that mm-hmm. was inside these crystals, it took them, well, they held on to the information until last year, Rob. And Dr. Boston revealed, uh, at that time, a paper, submitted it. And this paper revealed that the microbes that were found inside these crystals, are you ready for this? Yeah. 60,000 60, years old, 60,000 years old, living on God knows what, but we do know now it's called chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis. Right. So they ate the minerals off the walls. And in their database on planet Earth, they can't find a match for what they found inside these crystals. It was alien microbes. Now, do we mean alien because they're unknown to science, yes. or do we mean alien because they came from outer space? 
Well, this is a good question. What if the hypothesis mm -hmm. is, is these came from comets? Wow. All right, because comets are full of water yes. and water crashes on Earth. Mm -hmm. They also found microbes as far, far south as South Africa in Mexico. So what are microbes doing in Mexico? I don't know. <laughs> so we don't know how this all works. Is this the circulation of water in in in, in ways that we don't understand uh, through subduction? Yeah. Okay, so that could happen. And then again, why why are alien microbes? There's not a match on planet Earth. That it's it's the closest thing would be about twenty percent to alike like a mushroom uh, bacteria or microbe. That's it. Talk, they, a, talk about food for thought. Wow. You and I have to take our final break. What an interesting lady we have with us this hour, Exonation. Her name is Leela Hutchison, and her website is thecrystalgiants.com. She's the author of Journey into the Giant Selenite Crystal Caves of Mexico, and it's available on her website as well as amazon.com. We'll be back as we wrap up this hour here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the other side of this short break. Don't go away. What a fascinating lady our guest is this hour, Exo Nation. Her name is Leela Hutchison. She's the author of a brand new book entitled Journey into the Giant Sel Selenite Crystal Caves of Mexico. Her website is crystal, thecrystalgiants.com, and her book is available at her website as well as on Amazon.com. First of all, Leela, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure talking to you and so many interesting experiences that you've had and, and I for one am very grateful that you brought them back to the rest of us to share with so thank you oh you're my pleasure Rob I'm I'm, I'm very excited that you uh, you find this interesting topic enough to share with your listeners I, I read something in the information that you sent to Stephanie it's called fast radio bursts and and you have a theory about signals and crystals yeah, I do. Could you share that with us? Okay. Uh, this could be a far stretch for some people, but uh, and I'm still working on this. But At least you're working on it. <laughs> yeah, I am. I have never been able to give it up. There you go. So I think as I look at these crystals and have worked with energy and, and being part scientist as a mm -hmm. gemologist and then also doing healing work using the power and amplification of crystals on the body right. and looking at that in the auric field mm -hmm. of the human crystal. I believe we're a human crystal and are evolving into much more of that because we are comprised mostly of water and yes. water holds memory. So those are water crystals and blood crystals. When I look at the selenite crystals, and if you mm -hmm. see the, the cover of my book, Rob, you can see that they look like antennas. Yes. You know, they're at a, a diagonal, right? So, mm -hmm. and here's a, here's somebody like you in music that, you know, is very sensitive to sound. Yes. And radio waves and frequency. Mm -hmm. And you look at these and you, you can almost see that they look like transmitters and receivers. And that's exactly what crystals were used for once upon a time before the the artificial 
receivers, receiving modalities that we use today. I, I remember my first, my first CB set was a Holocrafter CB3A. It <laughs> took me two years to save up to buy it. And when you bought it, you only got one set of crystals. You had to buy the other ones. That's and so cool. It, it was. And then do you remember... Do you remember as as a child? I, maybe you don't, but I, I do. We had these little crystal radio sets that we would yes. put together. So yes. there is no way denying that crystals, number one, are powerful. Number two, they hold memories. Number three, and this is where some of my listeners will think that this is a far stretch. I don't believe we actually know 10% of of the knowledge that is hidden or yet to be rediscovered when it comes to crystals. Yay, me either. And I think you're totally right. And maybe what we do know has been suppressed by other technologies because this is so natural yeah. and, and abundant and readily available to us. Sometimes things are put right under our nose and they call it something else. And so we don't even recognize the value of that. I, I wonder what Nikola Tesla would have said about crystals. Oh, man. Well, he said, I'll, I have one quote for me. Oh, I super. wish I could remember it, but it's basically that, that the life mm -hmm. of a crystal uh, is inherent with, I think he said, knowledge. I have that in one of my PowerPoint slides because he did, he made a quote about it. Fascinating. And, and something else, the crystal skulls that are being discovered. You know, there, there's, there's so much to, to learn about crystals, the crystal skulls, as well as the other, the other gems that we have here on this planet. I don't think that it's just a, a coincidence or a synchronicity or, or, you know, geez, look, at this, this one has nothing to do with the other. I believe that everything on this planet is interwoven. I do, too. I definitely do. Yeah. So, so back to this, back to this uh, idea yeah. about signals. Squirrel, uh, we got lost. Okay. I'm here. No, 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 no. I, I said squirrel. That's what I tell my wife when I'm talking to her about one thing and she deviates to another topic. So I just did a squirrel. <laughs> no, I love it. I do love it. Um <laughs> Last year, they found, it actually started in 2012, they found these fast radio bursts that were from a galaxy 3 billion light years away. Okay, And wow. I believe, and I adore her, Linda Moulton Howe just yes. actually did some research on it. I have, I've got to find that mm -hmm. interview because I, I've been bringing it up uh, in a couple of my interviews uh, a year ago when I first discovered this because I... The, the the dishes at Arecibo mm -hmm. and Puerto Rico have been picking. That's the largest dish that picks up radio signals. And then there's the very large array outside of Socorro, New Mexico as well. That's part of the right. SETI array, right? Yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. I've been out there. Um, and because, I, you know, we're looking at a frequency. We're looking at frequencies. And I... I think about these selenite crystals transmitting and receiving mm -hmm. frequency. And with these fast radio bursts, what if what if whatever is coming from three billion light years away is being encoded and maybe uh, turned into other kind of data or receiving data? out there in the universe and it's being picked up by our crystals. I, I think that, and I've, and I've, when I've had Seth Shostak on, on the show, I've, I've said, Seth, how do you know that you're using the right, the right frequencies or the right modality to listen? What we're doing and what SETI is doing is they are using the science as known today to try and listen to an extraterrestrial message. If ETs are out there and they're sending a message, we could be listening with deaf ears because we're missing the type of transmission. Uh, wow, you're, so, you're yeah. so right. What if, they, if it was something like this? Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. This is, you know, and, and then is there a connection between the, the crystals in Mexico and the, Maya, uh, the Aztec and Mayan culture? Well, that's that's an interesting. So, with that culture, um, well, I think those cultures are based 
partially on ET visitation mm-hmm. for sure. I don't know because it's such a natural thing and such a hostile environment. Yes. I don't know if those uh, crystals that were formed in Nica, Chihuahua, Mexico were, but I have my theories about it, are a cluster of crystals that were deliberately stimulated to grow to be part of like a Arecibo maybe. Well, like let, let me ask you, any how, of them. how far is uh, a, a, a Mayan temple away from the location of the Nika caves? Nika, Nika um, caves, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, that's a good question. Let's see. So I've been, to, in fact, I just did some, I did some kind of crystal grid work down in Mexico mm-hmm. City in uh, uh, 2015 when I was there, 2014 on the 21st of December. Um, it's a good, good ways. I would say it's got to be at least uh, 1,200 miles. Oh, okay, so I was just trying to tie in the crystals with the, with the Mayan temples, and and then I was going to try and work my my question to you about the Sahara Desert and the pyramids in Egypt. Yeah, I know. You know well, amazing. well, but if you amazing. you've got to look at these limestone. These limestones yeah. have crystals in them as well. You know, so there's there's crystal particulates mm-hmm. like there is in granite as well. So they're definitely picking up things and receiving. And we know that we know that the, you know what incredible transmitters and receivers the the pyramids are. Yes. I think stone these monoliths are are um, they have way more abilities and properties than we know of. Um, this really brings in. I was just uh, having a conversation with Michael Tellinger. Have you interviewed him? Oh Rob? yes, yes I have. Oh, he's just. I mean, his he's work amazing. is. Wow, we were yeah. we were. We were really having a good time thinking about what those stones were doing and how they're putting out signals themselves, you know, it, the way that they are. Two questions for you, and I have to have short answers because I've got about a minute to share with you. Number one, is there a connection between, in your, just in your opinion, between crop circles and crystals and then Stonehenge and crystals? Crop circles? No, I think it's plasma. Okay. I don't think it's crystals at all. Okay. Could be. Stonehenge? Uh, yes, it's, yeah, it has something to do with crystals it, because the crystals are in the earth and yeah. the minerals carry crystals. You know, we've run out of time for tonight, Leila. I do want to thank you ever so much for visiting with us. We'll have to have you back on and uh, further discuss this and, and all the great work that you're doing. Um. Let our listeners know where they can get a copy of your book. And once again, give them your website number. Address. All right. Uh, www.thegiantcrystals.com. And you can, if you, if you ordered off my website, I'll be happy to send you a signed copy. And you'll know how to find me there through details. If not, you can order my book. It's just now been translated into Spanish wow. on Amazon.com. Leila, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Continued success, and I look forward to the next time you and I meet back here in the Exxon. Until then, thank, safe thank exploring. Exxon Nation, our guest this hour has been Leela Hutchison. Her website is thecrystalgiants.com. She's the author of Journey into the Giant Selenite Crystal Caves of Mexico. It's available on her website as well as Amazon.com. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. 